Hello everyone, my name is Garrett Owen and I'm a Floriculture Outreach Specialist and Researcher at Michigan State University. And today I'm gonna to be talking about how to successfully root vegetative cuttings. So today's presentation is gonna be about why root your own vegetative cuttings, what do you need to get started, and some of the cultural and environmental practices and management that you need to consider when producing your own rooted cuttings. So let's get started. So just to start off with, I wanna talk about the overview of vegetative cuttings and liner production. Where do our cuttings actually come from? So for the North American market, majority of our cuttings, for example, perennials, are started in stock plant facilities in Central and South America. These cuttings are produced by picking or excising the apical meristem of the stock plant or the mother plant, as pictured here. They are then bagged, boxed, and then taken to the airport where they are then shipped all the way to the U.S. to be received by propagators. Once received by the propagator at the propagation facility, they are then prepared and stuck and placed in the propagation environment where they are calloused and rooted to either be transplanted or to be shipped out to be received by another greenhouse producer. So again, this is just a general overview of the vegetative cutting and liner production for the North American market. Now there are opportunities or possibilities to receive cuttings from Africa as well. But again, this is just for the North American market that I'm giving an example for. So during this time of the transportation of the unrooted cutting to the operation facility to be calloused and rooting, these cuttings pass through different developmental phases and they can be established as stage zero, which is the harvesting and sticking of the cutting, stage two, callousing, Stage three is root development or initiation and development of the roots of that cutting. And then stage four is toning. So basically hardening it all for preparing that cutting to be transplanted into its final container or to be shipped out to be received by another producer. So again, this is the developmental phases that the cuttings pass through. So some of the questions that I receive as a greenhouse outreach specialist, why propagate my own cuttings? Why is it important to do that? Well, there are different advantages to produce your own cuttings, or excuse me, to produce your own liners or rooted cuttings. So why propagate your own cuttings? Shorter production time. So when we look at an example of a seed propagated versus vegetative propagated, for example, coleus in a 128 cell tray, you can see with vegetative cuttings that you can get almost three rounds of production space or three sets of cuttings that are rooted within that same space that you would only get one round of seed propagated coleus. And this would be similar for petunia that for petunia produced from cuttings about two to three um, rooted liner trays in the same time that you would get a single cell tray of 128 cell liners. Um, you can also have the production of sterile or seedless cultivars, such as, for example, penicetum. And you maintain genotypic and phenotypic uniformity. So here's an example of dianthus with the genotypic uniformity um, between two different good and bad rooting cultivars. Here's an example of the phenotypic and genotypic uniformity that you do not see here with these veg excuse me, with these seed propagated perennials, and then also that uniformity among rooted cuttings. So ultimately is that you have control in rooting your own cuttings, and then you know the history of your cuttings. So you know when you received the cuttings. You know what the environmental parameters were during callousing and rooting and toning of your cuttings. You know what, if any, PGRs were applied to these cuttings. So again, you have control and you know the history of the crop. So therefore you should know how these rooted cuttings will perform once they are transplanted into their final container. And another question that I received from those that are interested in producing their own rooted cuttings for the first time is what do I need to start to produce my own cuttings? What is that environment that I need? Well, first off is that you do not have to buy the top of the line equipment to be able to reach your own cuttings. And you don't have to build the newest greenhouse structure. However, I do want to note that depending on their structure, the environment, your rooting success and quality of rooted liners may vary. So here's an example of a greenhouse grower that had used a small polytunnel and some benches to either produce their own rooted cuttings or to start their own 
um, plugs from seed. So again, not the top of the line equipment, but again, it is working for this grower. So some of the other things that you may need is plant material. You need a reliable and good cutting supplier, and you also need the labor to stick these cuttings. Hard goods would be the liner trays or the propagation medium that you would need to root these cuttings in. And then you need to establish these cultural practices and maintain environmental, greenhouse environmental conditions to be able to callus and root and tone these cuttings as well. So this is just a general outline of what you may need to get started to root your own vegetative cuttings. And for today's presentation, I'm gonna be talking about more of the cultural practices in the greenhouse environments. So moving forward with the cultural practices, I wanna talk about pest control with cutting dips. So when you receive these cuttings from Central and South America, it is safe to think that these cuttings may not be clean. They may contain white flies, flower thrips, um, two-spotted spider mites. So what do you need to do to control these when you, when you receive these cuttings? Well, it's important to scout the incoming propagative material and to assume that these propagative materials are infested regardless if you can see the pest or not. So what are the actions that you do to make sure that you're preventing any um, introduction of pests? Well, not only quarantining the, the routing plant material, but also preventative um, cutting dips. So some of the research that Rose Burton House at the Violin Research Center has been working on is poinsettia cutting dips. And what she has found is a combination of insecticidal soap and botanogard or sulfur X oil has helped eliminate or reduce the amount of white fly being introduced in the greenhouse. However, I do want to note that the dip rates of the soap and the oil are lower than the spray rates to prevent any phytotoxicity that may occur on these cuttings. And she also found that these dips are compatible with biocontrol agents. So you will be able to use these um, biocontrols or these dips in combination. So to better explain this, I have a video. This video will illustrate the dipping technique and some important elements that will make dips successful. We have used poinsettia cuttings here, but the same principles apply to cuttings of other plant species. Pests hitchhike on plant materials that are shipped around the world. It is safe to assume that incoming material will be infested with one or more pests, like thrips, whiteflies, or spider mites, which more often than not, will be resistant to a wide range of products. Starting a crop with high pest numbers limits growers' pest control options. One technique that allows growers to start clean is cutting dips. For this, cuttings are immersed in low-risk products such as insecticidal soap, mineral oil, or botanogard, which will kill a large proportion of the pests hiding on the cuttings. The advantage of using biopesticides is that they have no or short residual activity and are highly compatible with a biocontrol program. Although all these products are considered low risk, be sure to use appropriate personal protective equipment when preparing and performing the dips. Dip rates are often lower than spray rates. Always test a small batch of cuttings for phytotoxicity first. Make sure the dipping tank is clean. Fill the tank with clean water and mix in the products. Here we used Copa insecticidal soap and Botanogard wettable powder. Mix the dip thoroughly. Spread the cuttings loosely in a mesh tray. Cover the cuttings with a second tray. Immerse the trays completely in the dip suspension. Gently move the trays around in the dip for at least 5 to 10 seconds. If you've done it right, all cuttings will be wet on both the upper and lower leaf surfaces. Do not pack cuttings too tight and do not compress the cuttings while dipping. Pests need to be contacted by the dip for products to be effective. There should be no dry areas after dipping. Many products tend to settle on the bottom of the tank. 
It is important to stir the dip frequently to keep the products in suspension. Prepare a new dip regularly to avoid potential accumulation of plant pathogens. Do not keep the dip suspension overnight and use the following day. Disinfect and rinse the dipping tank and equipment before a new dip is prepared. The risks of disease transfer using this technique are low, especially if you follow sanitation practices outlined earlier. Following dipping, cuttings are stuck as usual. So that video is available on YouTube through Greenhouse Canada. So just to recap what the recommendations that were established in the video for cutting dips is that it's important to establish proper dipping techniques by keeping the, the solution in suspension by agitating the solution. Um, make sure that there's complete coverage of the cuttings and to establish good sanitation practices such as using a clean water source, refreshing the dip solution, and also disinfecting the dip bath between um, different sources of cuttings or different species of cuttings as well. So risks that are associated with the cutting dips is that there is potential for a pathogen infection or a water pathogen or a waterborne pathogen that may be able to be spread. Um, also that the pest suppression and elimination may vary among bedding plant species or cuttings, you know, the different cuttings that you're um, rooting at that time. So it is important to conduct small in-house trials to determine if there is any phytotoxicity and to see what the suppression or elimination of these um, pests may be on these different varieties or these different species. And it's also important to do not dip stressed cuttings. Um, this may also lead to some phytotoxic effects as well. So with that, this wraps up the, um, the cutting dips and pest control. And again, this research has been established by Rose Button House at the Violin Research Station. So moving forward, we'd like to talk about the rooting hormone applications and that the, there are commercially available rooting hormones uh, or compounds available. And this list has been taken from Dolan Gibson's um, book. Um, this is just an example of some liquid and powder-based rooting hormones. So some of the questions that I do receive from growers is, do, do I need to apply a, a rooting hormone to all my unrooted cuttings? Well, the answer is it's not required by all bedding plants. However, it would be more recommended to uh, apply to those that are economically significant or more difficult to root. But in general, a rooting hormone will accelerate a root initiation and increase the uniformity and quality of your cutting as well or your rooted liner. So here's an example of a list of bedding plant species that either have a low benefit or high benefit of a rooting hormone application and those bedding plant species that may benefit. And again, this list is just an example and it was adapted by Dolan Gibson and also information supplied by Dr. Royal Hines. So looking at those bedding plants that have a low requirement of a rooting hormone, so they may not need one at all, would include coleus, impatiens, or petunias. But those that have a high benefit of a rooting hormone application may include dahlia, poinsettia, thumbergia. That may have some benefit may be calibricoa, fuchsia, lavender. So again, again, look at the, the list supplied by Dolan Gibson and see um, what bedding plants may require a rooting hormone. Or you can contact your cutting supplier and they can also provide some information about the cultural practices that you need to handle these cuttings if they need a rooting hormone or not. So with rooting hormone applications, they can be labor intensive if you are using either the liquid or powder because you need labor to stick these cuttings in the, those solutions or those hormones to be able to stick those into the tray. And then hand sticking is also time consuming. So before you dismiss even thinking about applying your rooting hormone, there is an alternative option. And this option is IBA foliar sprays. 
And these IBA foliar sprays are usually applied after sticking the cutting to the point of runoff and that the IBA concentration is often lower than the recommended rate for cutting dips. But it's important to conduct a small in-house trial because these rates and concentrations may be for specific crops or you may see a cultivar specific response as well. So some research conducted at North Carolina State University by Brian Whipker um, with KBI spray applications, what I'm going to be presenting now. So for example, this is Future Dollar Princess. So in the first photo, the photo at the top of the screen was photos taken at one week after spray application. So on the left, we have zero IBA spray concentration increasing all the way to 800. As you can see that from four and 800 parts per million IBA spray concentration, that there was some visually curling of the leaves of the fuchsia cuttings. However, when we look at the lower photo or the bottom photo, that's five weeks after spray application. There is vi visually um, no curling at the 400 and 800 parts per million AIBA spray concentration. But when we look at the individual root ratings of these fuchsia cuttings at five weeks after spray application, we found that there is a benefit or similarities between zero and 200 parts per million spray IBA um, concentration for fuchsia. With New Guinea impatience, Magnum Fire, again, the same setup with zero to 800 parts per million um, KIBA spray concentration. The photo on the top is taken one week after spray application. Again, there's no visually um, leaf curling here. And then that lower photo is four weeks after spray application. And what they found is that at 200 parts per million IBA concentration that there was a higher root rating than those at four and 800 and also at zero parts per million KIB concentration. For agaranthemum, beauty yellow, the photo at the top was taken one week after spray application at four and 800 parts per million KIBA. There was again that visually curling of the leaves and then the photo on the bottom is three weeks after spray application and you can see that there's still that persistent leaf curling at 400 and 800 parts per million KIBA spray concentration. But when we look at the root rating, again, the 200 parts per million KIBA spray concentration produce the best or the greatest averaged um, root rating overall. However, I do want to point out that 800 parts per million KIBA did produce a greater rooted cutting than at 200, but again, there was that visually curling of the leaves and also there was the similar, you're applying more um, hormone at 800 than at 200 as well. So it's um, better off to spray that 200 and you're reducing the leaf curling. So in general, what Brown Whipker found at North Carolina State University that rooting was less at the higher IBA concentration rates. There was that distorted growth like I just mentioned with the um, agaranthemum. And this is just for the annual bedding plants that they have trialed that the optimum IBA concentration from the foliar sprays is considered to be about 200 parts per million. And again, this is for the, the annual bedding plants that um, Brown Whipker trialed, but it's important to also do some, some small in-house trials for yourself as well to see what the species of cultivar responses um, are. So moving forward with the last cultural practice being fertility is that a lot of the questions I receive is do I need to provide cuttings for nutrition during propagation? Well, low nutrition at stick and throughout propagation can delay or slow down rooting and result in non-uniform rooting of these cuttings. And cuttings will become nutrient deficient during propagation if fertility is not provided or if these cuttings come in already low in nutrition. And it has been reported that greater susceptibility to diseases during propagation when they are nutrient deficient. So here's an example of um, yellow petunias that were rooted. The photo on the left is the yellow petunias without any nutrition. The photo in the middle, that liner tray in the middle, is 50 parts per million nitrogen. And then the liner tray on the right is 100 parts per million nitrogen. So you can clearly see here in this example that nutrition is important during propagation. So another question is, well, when do I start providing nutrition? 
Well, tissue nutrient concentration often drops right after the cutting is harvested, so in that developmental stage of zero, to just after sticking the cuttings at stage one. But it, nutrition often increases at root formation, which is stage three, or root initiation, root formation, and development. So here's an example of when do I start, what I just described. You have the initial drop from stage zero to stage one at stick. But from stage one to stick to stage three, you can see there's that slight in increase in um, cutting nutrient content. And then once the roots have developed, they are formed, they're able to take up nutrients, you can see an exponential uh, increase in the cutting nutrient concentration moving from stage three of rooting to stage four of toning. So according to a survey that I conducted with perennial propagators is that some growers are producing um, rooted cuttings from providing nutrition between seven and 14 days. Some are providing nutrition at three to five days during the callusing phase, whereas some propagators are not providing any nutrition whatsoever until actually the cuttings have been either toned and transplanted at that facility or once they have to receive from the other, um, the grower that had ordered in these rooted cuttings. So, Again, this is going to vary, but um, it is important to provide nutrition during propagation. It just depends on what stage you feel the most comfortable in providing that nutrition at the stage three of rooting, stage two of callusing, or not at all. So another question I receive is, how do I provide cuttings with nutrition? Well, you can provide nutrition through water-soluble sources, such as mist or hand irrigation, which is daily. So um, just to go back to the mist, I do want to indicate that that is not a form of irrigation. That is just to keep the cuttings turgid, but some uh, instances that you can provide nutrients during the mist. But again, like I said, hand irrigation on a daily basis is a more common method to provide uh, plant nutrition to rooted cuttings. Um, however, it has been found that up to 13 pounds per thousand um, square feet of nitrogen may be applied during propagation and of that 24% of the nitrogen is being leached. So we want to take into account how much is nitrogen is being applied and how much is going to be leached as well. So an alternative way to provide nutrition is controlled release fertilizer. So this would be an application of incorporating the controlled release or slow release fertilizer into the propagation medium. So some of the factors that you need to consider is the type of controlled release fertilizer. So there's the urea formaldehyde, sulfur coated and polymer coated um, controlled release fertilizers, and then also the release rate. There's the um, constant increase or release. Um, there's that lag phase at the very beginning and then there's the increase or and then there's the exponential um, release rate as well. So this is something to take into account also when thinking about um, choosing a controlled release fertilizer to use in your propagation medium. So here's an example of some research by Curry and Lopez from 2014 where they have investigated different bedding plants that were rooted in a propagation medium that had a 15912 controlled release fertilizer. So this is New Guinea patients celebrate rose red. And what they found is that there was um, similar root dry mass at zero, five, and 10 pounds of the CRF that was incorporated into the substrate. With Angelonia, the same controlled release fertilizer, they found zero to 10 pounds per cubic yard that was incorporated, that slow release incorporated into the propagation medium, is that root dry mass was similar among the, um, the three rates. With geranium, um, again, that zero to 10 pounds produced root dry mass of similar values, but with the Petunia Cascadia marshmallow pink, there was no significant difference among the increasing rates from zero to 40 pounds per cubic yard. However, I do want to point out that it may not be statistically significant, there was an increase of uh, root dry mass at that five pounds per cubic yard of that um, controlled release fertilizer that was amended into the propagation medium. So they kind of crunched some numbers and they found that if you incorporated the control release fertilizer at five pounds per cubic yard, it cost about four cent per 105 cell tray. And then if you went with the 10 pounds um, per cubic yard, it adds on another seven cent per um, 105 cell propagation tray. So that's something to consider an alternative to 
um, water soluble fertilizers is to incorporate a controlled release fertilizer into your propagation medium and providing that nutrition during propagation. So moving forward, I want to talk more about the environmental practices and management during the callousing and rooting of vegetative cuttings. So there are different propagation environments that cuttings are um, calloused and rooted in. That could be a glass glazed greenhouse, and this is where cuttings are rooted on the floor or on benches under supplemental lighting. And poly um, greenhouses, high tunnels or poly tunnels or even in shade and lath houses. It all depends on what part of the United States, for example, that you're in and what greenhouse environment that you have to be able to propagate in. So in general, as we move from stage two, which is callousing, to stage four in toning, the propagation environment needs to be um, changed for that stage or that developmental phase of that cutting. So when we move from stage two to stage four, again, callousing the toning, that we need to increase the light levels. We need to decrease the temperature, decrease the amount of moisture provided to the cuttings, um, start to increase plant nutrition, and again, decrease uh, the humidity because the cutting, by the time it moves from stage two to stage four, is developed callus, is developed roots. The, the cutting itself is staying more turgid, it's taking up plant, uh, it's taking up nutrition, moisture, so it's being able to survive on its own and not being babied as we initially do once we stick cuttings to the callusing phase. So in talking about the factors that affect root growth and development in the greenhouse, um, light temperature, which can include air, water, substrate temperature, mist, moisture, and also fertility. But of those, the key environmental factors that determine rooting success is light and temperature, which both drive plant growth and development. So I'm going to talk about light first, is that when we talk about light, we talk about it as the photosynthetic photon flux, which is the primary driver of plant growth. And this is often referred to as the instantaneous amount of light, which is the amount of light that's falling at this um, given time right now. And it varies over the course of the day, over the week, propagation season, over the course of the year, and also where you are in the United States. And we can think of um, the photosynthetic photon flux as rain that's falling down within a given square meter. When we talk about light in a cumulative manner, we refer to that as the photosynthetic daily light integral, which is the cumulative and integrated measurement of light over the course of a day. And again, we can refer to this as that photosynthetic photon flux is the instantaneous light falling within that given area. And the daily light integral is more of that rain gauge of how much, if we can measure how much of those photons have fallen within that time, um, how much has been collected within that day. And we can also uh, measure this through um, different sensors. Here's an example of a portable sensor that determines um, micromoles per meter square per second, which is that instantaneous light, the daily light integral, and also the intensity in terms of foot candles as well. So what happens if you don't have enough light? Well, that's where you can employ supplemental lighting to increase that daily light integral, and that could be either from high pressure sodium lamps or HPS lamps or lighting emitting diodes or LEDs. And again, this is often employed during the propagation stage, but we do see this during the finishing stages as well to increase that daily light integral. So here's an example of a propagation facility in Germany that's using day extension supplemental lighting to increase the daily light integral during propagation of these unrooted cuttings. And that there are benefits of using supplemental lighting during seed and vegetative annual propagation. Um, there's been quite a bit of research conducted at uh, Michigan State University that has uh, researched the use of supplemental lighting during vegetative cutting propagation. So here's an example of the average outdoor daily light integral um, during January through March. And this is when a lot of um, vegetative cuttings are being uh, rooted during that time. And then the lower figure is the benefits of supplemental lighting from January through March. So you can see in January through February for Michigan, there is a large benefit of providing supplemental light. But when we get into March, there's that moderate benefit and then it just declines as we move into later spring months or into the summer as well. 
But according to Owen and Lopez, who conducted that perennial propagation survey, they found that a lot of perennial propagators producing cuttings or rooting cuttings during February through April, again, where there is a need for supplemental lighting. But they found that the majority of perennial propagators are, are rooting cuttings through May and July, so they may not need to provide supplemental lighting, that they may need to provide shade to reduce the amount of light um, within that propagation facility. And then during August through October, there's also um, perennials being propagated during the fall months. So this may be where there's a combination of both shade and supplemental lighting that needs to be employed during the propagation as well. So in a greenhouse or in a propagation greenhouse, um, the daily light integral um, seldom exceeds 30 moles per meter square per day. And this can be reduced by 30 or 40% by the greenhouse structure, the glazing material, the whitewash on the greenhouse, and even pollen or airborne pollutants that have settled on either the glazing material, the glass, or the poly as well. So um, you need to take into account that the daily light integral often does not exceed the 30 moles per meter square per day. So here's an example of a glass glazed greenhouse um, where these leucanthemum cuttings are being propagated. And you can see that the light transmission is being reduced by the greenhouse structure and also the hanging baskets that are suspended above um, this crop of, like I said, leucanthemum that's being calloused and rooted. So what are the plant responses to increasing DLI? Well, there's often um, smaller and thicker leaves, increased branching, increased stem diameter, reduced plant height, so the, the rooted cuttings are more compact, increased root draw mass, and they often flower faster due to temperature from um, higher daily light integral as well. So here's an example of Achillea apricot delight. This photo was taken 16 days after propagation under a daily light integral, the cutting on the left is 1.5 and the cutting on the right was propagated under a daily light integral of 10. So as you can clearly see, there's more leaves. Uh, the cutting itself is more compact, there's more roots. Um, and if we would be able to measure, I'm sure that the stem diameter was um, thicker as well compared to that cutting that was propagated under a daily light integral of 1.5. Here's another example of Heuchera amber waves that was propagated at increasing daily light integrals of 1.5, 4, 10, and 15. And that what we found is that um, as we increase daily light integral, the number of leaves increased, stem caliper increased, root dry mass also increased up to 10 moles per meter square per day. So here's some work conducted by Curie et al. in 2012 by Agaranthemum who looked at rooting cuttings under ambient solar light and ambient solar light and HPS um, supplemental lighting from a daily light integral of 1.4 to 12.3. And what they found is D as DLI increased, root dry mass increased as well. Now, what about light quality? Well, light quality can affect photomorphogenesis and it influences the liner quality such as stem length and caliper leaf area. However, there is unknown effects of callusing and rooting. And this is important for investigators to, to research and growers to consider because there is that phasing from going from HPS lamps to LEDs and we need to understand what are the plant responses to light quality. So again, this is some other work by Curry and Lopez in 2013 who compared three different light qualities from LEDs to HPS lamps for impatience and petunias, and that they found that there's no significant differences really when looking at these, um, these cuttings propagated under LEDs versus HPS lamps. And again, there is no differences in the flowering time for, um, or quality of flowering for geranium, impatience, and petunias. However, there has become more interest in using sole source LED lighting technology, not only for tissue culture and for plug propagation, leafy greens, microgreens, and small fruits, but also can you root vegetative cuttings within a closed environment, a controlled environment under LEDs? And what are those photomorphogenic responses that the cuttings have? So research conducted by um, during my PhD, looked at four different light qualities in a walk-in grow chamber and how the cuttings uh, responded to these light qualities. 
and we wanted to assess how does callusing um, be how is callusing influenced by light quality as well. So I've rooted two different perennials, Gara and Salvia, under 100% red light, 0% blue light, 75% red light, 25% blue light, 50% red light, 50% blue light, and 100% blue light in a walk-in um, grow chamber had root zone heating from heating mats, and then we had um, little propagation tents or um, containers over them to keep the cuttings turgid. And then we compared that to supplemental lighting in the greenhouse that was provided by or HPS lamps. So as you can see here, this is the progression of rooting of GARA from two to 10 days and that we found there was no significant effects on callusing or rooting. And what we found is that you can root vegetative cuttings under LED sole source lighting and that there was no negative effects and that when you root cuttings under 50% red light and 50% blue light provided by these LEDs at a daily light interval of 3.4 and roots on temperature of 75, is that the cuttings will be shorter, they have higher root dry mass, which is more commercially desirable when you're thinking about a nice, compact, well-rooted cutting that can withstand shipping or being transplanted at a younger age. And again, this research has been published in um, a recent magazine for LEDs for propagation by W. Garrett Owen and Roberto G. Lopez. So the next thing I wanna talk about is temperature and that temperature influences many physiological processes such as photosynthesis, respiration, transpiration, and root and shoot development. So as you can see here, we have a computerized control system for a greenhouse operation that's measuring air temperature um, here's root zone temperature in this um, ornamental grass propagator and then being able to control and measure um, the root zone temperature of these um, rooted cuttings. When we talk about plant development, it's often temperature dependent. So we have the base temperature whereas there's little plant development occurring, but as we increase temperature, the rate of plant development increases linearly up to the optimum temperature. Once we get above this optimum temperature, we see a decline in the rate of plant development until it ceases at the maximum temperature. So for root zone temperature, for increasing that medium temperature up to the optimum temperature, we see that there is hastened time to visible root formation and that you usually get an increased number of roots per cutting but once we get above that optimum temperature, there's also, or often a um, deleterious impact on rooting, that the cuttings will stop or not produce as many roots per cutting. Um, you'll see visual decrease in root development, and usually suboptimal temperatures may inhibit or limit adventitious root formation as well. So root temperature is critical for callus induction and root initiation. So some research that we have looked at at Michigan State University is for perennials, what is the optimum temperature for callusing? We, we trialed 12, 8, 12 different perennials, and I'm just going to show you um, two of them today, is that for Coriopsis lime rock ruby, is that we found that they will callus uniformly at three days after sticking at a root zone temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit. For Russian sage, we found that cuttings will uniformly callus at five days at 75 degrees Fahrenheit under a daily light integral of 5.5 moles per meter square per day. So in general, we found that we can group these cuttings based on how fast they callus, and we found that Coreopsis, Gara, and Lamium will callus uh, within three days. Achillea, Agastache, um, Hookera Black Beauty, and Peppermint Spice, Leucanthemum, Peroskia, which is Russian sage that I mentioned before, Phlox, and Salvia will callus within five days, and Gloria we found it to be a slow callusing species. So looking at purple fountain grass, these cuttings were Callused and rooted under a daily light integral of eight moles per meter square per day. 
under root zone temperatures from 70, 73, 77, and 81 degrees Fahrenheit. And we found as we increased root zone temperature up to 73 degrees Fahrenheit, we found that there was 90% um, rooting success. So that would be the optimal temperature. And then as we increased from 73 to 81, we found the maximum temperature because root percentages or number of cuttings that rooted declined. Again, we saw a similar trend with the number of roots that were um, present per liner and also the root dry mass. So again, that optimal temperature for propagating purple fountain grass rubrum is 73 degrees Fahrenheit, as you can see here. So this research has also been published in Greenhouse Grower in January of 2017. So if you're interested in this work, um, it is available online. And now I want to switch gears and talk about light and temperature combined. What are the effects there? And that's where we also looked at rooting, again, all these different perennial species at different root zone temperatures and daily light integrals. So this again is Coreopsis lime rock ruby. The photos that you see pictured here were of cuttings that were calloused for three days and then in a propagation environment for 14 days. And that propagation environment had a air temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit and a relative humidity of 60 degrees. So from when we went to callousing to rooting, we dropped or reduced that air temperature and also reduced uh, the relative humidity as well. And then we looked at three different root zone temperatures of 68, 75, and 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, daylight light integrals of 1.5, 4, 10, and 15. And what we found is that Coreopsis rooted um, the best, or produced the best rooted quality liner at a root zone temperature of 75 and a daily light integral of 10. Now switching gears to Hookra Black Beauty, um, these cuttings were rooted for five days, or excuse me, callus for five days and rooted for 14 days in a similar propagation environment. And what we found is that we had a well-rooted cutting um, at a root zone temperature of 75 degrees and a daily light integral of 10 degrees. But I do want to go ahead and step back a moment and talk about the, um, the optimum temperature being 75 degrees because once we went from 75 degrees to 82, that was at maximum temperature. As you can see, there is no root growth or development that had occurred. So again, the optimum temperature is 75 and daily light integral of 10. With uh, Gallardia Gallo Red, um, these cuttings were calloused at eight days and rooted for 14 days in a similar propagation environment for a total of 22 days of propagation. And again, what we found was that a root zone temperature of 75 and a daily light integral of 10 um, produced a well-rooted and high-quality liner. So again, this information is all available um, in Grower Talks in, um, in July and August. There's a two-part series. One's on um, callousing, the other one's on rooting. So for more information, please uh, refer to these articles. Or again, you can um, send me an email and I'll gladly be able to answer your questions as well. So there are some resources that are available if you are interested in um, rooting cuttings for the first time or just need a refresher as well. So the book on the left is Cutting Propagation by Dole and Gibson. This is the book that I referred to earlier in the webinar. And then there's also one available for plug and transplant production. And this is by Steyer and Korneski. Um, this is also a good resource as well. With that, there's also some more information if you go to the MSU, uh, Floriculture and Greenhouse Crop Production website, we have quite a bit of information available for annual bedding plant production, perennials, light, temperature, PGRs, propagation, and um, other information that you'll find useful as well. So I do want to point out that I did talk about light and temperature in this webinar is that they um, Roberto Lopez and Eric Runkle have produced a new um, light management and controlled environment book that there is a chapter on propagation that could answer some of the questions or provide some more information on lighting within the greenhouse or propagation environment that you may have. With that, I would like to acknowledge all the um, foundations, organizations, and private horticulture and lighting companies that supported the MSU research as well. And with that, I thank you for tuning in for today's 
uh, webinar on how to successfully root vegetative cuttings.